So amines are even more nucleophilic than water and alcohol. So that means they'll react with acid chlorides and acid anhydrides as well. And we have two examples shown here in these two equations. Now, as the title suggests, these are called aminolysis reactions. And they go through and they produce amides. Now, let's look at the mechanism for how this happens. So we're going to start with our friendly acyl chloride. right? And we are going to first undergo a nucleophilic addition, just like we saw previously. So remember, you need to be looking for patterns. Now, what you're going to see here is we've got like parentheses and a G here. And so that just means like any sort of units. Now, I want you to notice one equivalent of amine is required as a nucleophile. And we're going to talk about amine equivalents in a second. But this is going to come here and it's going to attack that carbonyl carbon. And it's going to bump those electrons up onto that oxygen. Then what we're going to see, right, is that tetrahedral intermediate. And I'm just looking back and forth and making sure I've got all my carbons and all my groups. Okay. Now, what happens next is what we saw before where we have a proton transfer. Right? where these electrons come in and they steal that proton. When they steal that proton, those electrons go back up onto the nitrogen. Right and there, there we have that. So now we've got our tetrahedral intermediate. So it's going to go through a nucleophilic elimination and a tetrahedral collapse. Where these electrons come back down here and it bumps off that chlorine as a leaving group. And so you end up with an amide. Right like that. Um, so as I've mentioned before, something really important for aminolysis reactions is the number of equivalents of the amine required. And so a big deal here is that two equivalents of an amine are required. Now, according to the mechanism, which you can look at on the previous page, I can't go back because otherwise it'll cause the screencast to skip. Um, the first equivalence used in step one where the amine acts as a nucleophile and attacks the carbonyl carbon of the acid chloride. The second equivalent is used in step two where it acts as a base to deprotonate the positively charged nitrogen from the original molecule. Now, if the amine is readily available and pretty cheap, um, it's acceptable to carry out this reaction with just by adding two equivalents of the amine. So for example, instead of using, if, because it reacts in a one to one mole ratio, right? Instead of using one mole, maybe use two moles, right? But if the amine is difficult to obtain or expensive, then what people do is only use one equivalent and another amine such as pyridine or triethylamine, which is shown here, um, are added to the reaction mixture to act as the base, okay? And that frees up the desired amine to act as the nucleophile. 
So for example, um, the one on the previous uh, page um, uses two amine equivalents, but if we look here, right, at this one, you can see that there's only one equivalent of the nucleophile required because pyrimidine is, sorry, pyridine is used as the base. Um, you can also see here, right, this is a triethyl amine being used as the base as well, and only one equivalent used. So sometimes you'll see these, um, these happen. Now, the reason these are good choices of bases is because, right, neither pyridine or, right, neither of these have a nitrogen. bonded to a hydrogen, okay? So that means even though they can undergo nucleophilic addition elimination with an acid chloride or acid anhydride, they wouldn't have a subsequent proton transfer that could take place to produce a stable uncharged amide. So this reduces your risk of um, unwanted side products. Now, the use of pyridine or triethylamine as a base is not limited only to aminolysis. Um, if you look back at alcoholysis or hydrolysis, um, you'll notice that HCl is effectively a byproduct. And what happens here is as that acid accumulates, the protonated form of the alcohol or water becomes more abundant. And so that slows down the reaction and compromises the yield. So to kind of fix this problem with this pH imbalance, an excess or alcohol or water can be used, but people have also found that you can add pyridine or triethylamine to help neutralize that acid. So just some considerations um, to think about as we are designing synthesis. Now, maybe the burning question in your heart is, Dr. Pierce, we have been talking about this reactivity ladder for the last two chapters, right? And how you can take an acid chloride or an acid halide make all these other things. But how do you get back to the top, right? Like if that's the most reactive, how do you get back to the top? And so um, <clears throat> the way that you do this is a separate reaction, okay? And the reaction that we're going to use is one where you can react thionyl chloride which is SOCl2, um, or phosphorus trichloride, which is shown right there. Um, and those can be used to convert carboxylic acids into acid chlorides. Um, of these, thionyl chloride is more widely used. Um, mostly because um, the two byproducts, SO2 and HCl, are gases that bubble out. Right, and so um, they make this reaction irreversible, okay? And according to Le Chatelier's principle, right, really shifted over here, so it's very favorable. Um, so that's how we can go back and synthesize an acid chloride or an acyl chloride, right? So let's look at this thionyl chloride mechanism to see how it works. So we're gonna start by writing our reactants. And the first step is a nucleophilic addition reaction. Right? Where we have um, the thionyl chloride there, and that's the that's the uh, Lewis structure of it. And what happens here is that the electrons on this oxygen are going to go and they're going to attack this sulfur. 
When they attack that sulfur, they bump the electrons up here onto the oxygen. Now, when they do this, okay, um, you end up with a resonance structure, okay? And I'm going to show you this resonance structure. Right. And so when we look at this, okay, the electrons that are here are delocalized here and then here. And so the structure that we get, right, as our resonance structure is this guy. Okay, now, um, I paused that for a second because I didn't love what I did with the arrow colors, so I'm going to change that a little bit. I want the blue here to be the resonance structure because I'm also going to show a mechanism here, and so I want the mechanisms to stay in white, okay, or red, okay? So when we look at this, it's going to go through a nucleophilic elimination where these electrons come down here and this chlorine is a leaving group there. So again, the mechanisms here are staying in red and to show you the difference between the resonance structures, that's in blue, just so I don't, we don't confuse that. Okay. Um, now, that undergoes nucleophilic elimination. And one of the reasons I want to show you the resonance structure is because this form is going to, and I left out my NO2s here, so let me go back. That form where those red arrows are is going to be the part that goes on and reacts. that we show the best in the mechanism. Now we know, right, that it really means that these electrons are delocalized, but this is the particular form that shows the mechanism the best. Okay, so we've got that Cl minus, right? And what's gonna happen is this is undergo, gonna go undergo a nucleophilic addition. where these electrons here are going to come in, missing electron there, are going to come in and attack that carbon right there. Now, when they attack that carbon right there, those electrons are going to jump right there. Okay, and so now... Right, we have another nucleophilic elimination where these electrons are going to go here, right? And then this whole group leaves. Now, 
So that underwent a nucleophilic elimination. And we've made over here right this substance now I do want to talk for a second about when this group leaves okay so when that group leaves it leaves as this guy but what happens is there's a rearrangement and these electrons come here and it bumps that off as the leaving group and so that's how we get um, SO2 as a gas, right? And then we end up with chlorine minus, which eventually um, combines with a hydrogen, which I'm going to show you in this next step. Okay, so we also get that and chlorine minus. Okay, so here we are in this next step. And in this next step, we're going to have a proton transfer with that same chlorine minus. Right, where it's going to come in and steal that proton, and those electrons are going to go on the oxygen. Now, when that happens, that forms a this guy. All right, so now we formed our acyl chloride, but we also form HCl as a gas, and that bubbles off. So that's how we form the SO2 and the HCl, and that, um, that bubbles off there. So this is how we go back and we synthesize any acyl chlorides. Now, let's do a sample problem, okay? So let's look at this guy. It says, propose how you would carry out a synthesis shown here in which an amide is converted into an acid anhydride. Now, with this particular question, there's some, some questions you need to ask yourself, okay? Um, when we look at this, we need to evaluate the target. So the target here is an acid anhydride. So we're just kind of getting the lay of the land. And this is an amide. Okay, now the acid anhydride appears near the top of the stability ladder. Right, and an amide, right, um, is below it. And so we need to think about... Um, how we can produce this, right? So to make the anhydride, we need to choose an acid derivative precursor that appears even higher on the stability ladder. Okay, and so um, <clears throat> maybe we should use an acyl chloride, right? And so as we think through this and as we think in reverse, we need to say, okay, hey, look, we've got this guy. Okay, and we know we cannot make an, an amide, which is lower, into something higher. But if we can somehow set this up so that we, we go from an acyl chloride into the acid anhydride, that's how we would want to do it. So we would think, okay, hey, look, we need to figure out a way to synthesize this. Okay. Um, and then the question, of course, is, well, 
what precursor would we need to make an acyl chloride? And what we just learned is, hey, we can make these from carboxylic acids. So we would need this precursor. Right? And so then the question would be, well, can you make a carboxylic acid from an amide? Right? And you can. You can do that by hydrolysis. Right? So here we're going to undo an acyl substitution. Here we're going to undo an acid chloride formation. And here we're going to undo a hydrolysis. Right? And so this is how we can go from an amide to an acid anhydride. And so now we just need to think about the synthesis going in the forward direction. So when we think about the synthesis going in the forward direction, we're going to say, all right, we've got this guy and we want to turn him into a carboxylic acid. What reagents do I need to be able to do this? Okay. We need a base, so we're going to do KOH, right, in water. And then we're going to do an acid workup. Okay, so that's the hydrolysis. Then I'm going to go from this carboxylic acid to this acid chloride. And we just learned that vinyl chloride right there is the way to go. Okay, now you could use PCL3 there. That's fine, right? So this is one of those situations where um, you can you can have different answers than your neighbor, okay? And then we want to ask ourselves, all right, what would we want to use to get to the um, acid anhydride that we see there? Okay. And so we would use that guy, which would the sodium there is a spectator ion, so we would end up with a negative charge. And there is our product. So hopefully this helps see how um, being able to synthesize those acid chlorides are really valuable um, so that you can get back to the top of the stability ladder and use them in synthesis.